uh, artists understanding where their worth is because they'll go into the table saying this ten thousand dollar advance for three albums doesn't make sense because i can make x off of my money by myself we have a lot of higher ups that see talent and are able to snatch said talent because of the desperation of the artist right. right a lot of the time exposure does not equate to money it does not translate all the time when we come to the representation of chicago in our music scene the picture of, of the diversity is shown as opposed to the main focus being with drill music which there's nothing mm. wrong with that but you need that yin and yang flow of things if you're going to really represent chicago you call your wife your homie and i'm like that's yeah. what's up well, that's my homie that's my dog she doesn't <laughs> she really hates when i call her my homie but i don't care and i'm saying it publicly now that's yeah that's my homie if you're an artist or creative interested or curious about what goes on in the world of business and tech or you're a tech entrepreneur who's interested in being close with fashion designers or musicians then this show is for you because it's conversations with the coolest people making it happen at the forefront of technology, culture, business, and the arts. Uh, welcome everybody. We are back here today on another episode of the Intersection Podcast at the intersection of technology and culture where I talk to the coolest people making it happen at the forefront. Oh of yeah. <laughs> I didn't know that that's the requirement. All right, let's go. Let's go. Eddie, you are officially now one of the coolest people on planet Earth. Um, okay. <laughs> I don't even need a, a plaque or anything. Just the notification alone <laughs> is fine with me. Let's do this. Cool. Um, Eddie, Eddie is, uh, I didn't even finish the, uh, the little tagline, but it's okay. It's all right. right? If you've seen another episode, you know it already. Uh, coolest people at the intersection of business, tech, uh, culture, and the arts. Eddie is a music business professional, a, an attorney, and the founder of Protect and Collect, a law firm that specializes in intellectual property and artist management. Eddie's an educator who's taught at SAE and is an adjunct professor at Columbia College Chicago. He's a public speaker who's done stuff at uh, tech and culture conferences like AC3 and South by Southwest. Sometimes he's a DJ, and Eddie is very much connected and plugged into the Chicago music and cultural scene. Uh, Eddie, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me. Yeah. So uh, yesterday when I talked to Emma, Emma McKee, the stitch guy, she said... What up, Emma? <laughs> Emma said you, uh, sometimes people will call you Finesse Squire. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they will. Because apparently you can get anybody into any backstage area. Uh, yeah, I have a reputation for being able to finesse through security and get into venues that I'm not technically supposed to be in. How do you yeah. do that? Uh, do you have uh, any well, trade secrets? Allegedly, um, the way I'm able to perform these tasks is understanding what security needs to hear to get into some of these spaces. What do they need to hear? Uh, they need to hear confidence. They need to have show. You have to show an ability that I'm here, but I really don't want to be here. So the only reason I am here is because somebody asked me to show up. So there shouldn't be any discussion as to why my name isn't on the list. That's actually a very good trade secret. I wasn't expect. That's a gem right there. Boom. Word. Okay. Wow. We get a little drum emoji <laughs> that drops down. Gem emoji. <laughs> Bing. I'll be right back. Um, is there anything else? So, so when you say like. Uh, you said you, but you don't want to be there. What do you mean? You have to be because if you're too pressed, like let me in, let me in, mm -hmm. then they're like, oh no, you're just a fan trying to show up. So I think it was one of the best stories when I was with them. We're at South by Southwest. Me and a couple of the homies pull up to the Spotify house, and Tanashi, uh, two other artists. I just remember Tanashi. <laughs> Because I used her to actually get in. Don't even know her like that. The line was huge, and we're like, how are we going to get in? Walked to the side of the venue, and I said, hey, where's the artist's interest? They were like, um, I think it's around back. Who are you with? They told me, I was like, they're like, Tanashi. I was like, all right, cool. <laughs> yeah, we're with Tanashi. Right, where's the artist's interest? We need to get in here. I think she goes on in like 10, 15 minutes. They're like, okay, right this way. As soon as we get to the back, they're white radioing for us. Like, okay, these four guys are they're with the artists. Let's make sure they get them in. She's going on stage soon. Next thing you know, we're in the venue. They're like, how did confidence and saying the right things? That's wild. That's wild how you can do that with almost any like private space. Pretty much. So I'm kind of like wedding crashers, but festival crashers. <laughs> festival crashers. Yeah. 
Do you have any other any other fun moments or fun stories of finesquiredness? Yeah, I, I have a lot of them, but they're all alleged. alleged. You know, I, did, I <laughs> don't know if they all happened, you know, because I don't know the statute of limitations mm. for trespassing in a sense, you know. But, mm-hmm. no, I'm always, I mean, even for the most recent one was this Beyonce show at Soldier oh, wow. Field. Yeah, we... Me and my family had seats in section like 200 Mm -hmm. or something like that. And we just used our confidence and walked all the way down to the floor. So we had floor seats for Beyonce when we weren't even supposed to be in that section. And it was just knowing how to maneuver and get around and playing the right angles. So when you say playing the right angles, you just you just mean literally walking. Yeah, because we have (laughs) there's humans that Uh are checking this. Mm. You know, we're not talking about robots actually scanning your wrist. Humans aren't going to see everything, and or they're not going to. If you're not making yourself obvious to them, they're not really going to be focused in on you. They're just trying to get through their shift. They're not trying to be super police and stop everyone. They're just like, okay, show me your brand bands, whatever the case may be. You got to play into that sometimes, you know. Mm-hmm. Allegedly. 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 Yeah. Let's just keep that theme going when we talk about these escapades right speaking of uh, allegedly and the statue of limitations i would love to hear your like story about getting into law like what what, what was it about law that drew you in it was interesting because i did undergrad at virginia state during the time i was a marketing major and i was also playing baseball so I was never a pre-law, uh, history, or any type of guy. Took one of those aptitude tests because after school I was like, I want to do something else. Want to go get a degree in something else, and then I just stumbled upon law. My deductive reasoning, my logic reasoning. They said I scored high in. They're like, just think about going to law school. Get to law school. Really don't have an idea of what I want to practice in, but I'm gonna stay here and I'm gonna get this law degree. During the time I started DJing. Interesting. Uh, I was working. I was DJing and working security at this spot called Empire Liquors. So at this time, I'm meeting, and we just joked about the scene. I was meeting everybody in the scene at that time. The scene. Yeah. You mean here in Chicago? Here in Chicago. So I'm meeting. The scene. Right. So this is around the Cool Kids era, Hollywood Hope, Mano, uh, Kid Sister, Flossadamus, that era. So meeting those guys, understanding what some of their troubles were, was like okay. Instead of trying to focus on being some type of rapper, producer, whatever the case may be, I can help the ecosystem by providing legal services. So then just started focusing in on IP, and that was the rest after that. Hmm. So it was almost like you were in this inklings of being in the midst of being involved in law, but then based on the people you were around, you immediately saw like, oh, I could provide a lot of value by... Yeah, I mean, if you... It, as entrepreneurs, I think this is important to understand when you're creating a business, everything should be about problem solving. Yeah, yeah. You know, and the only way you can solve a problem is if you can take a step back, view the entire ecosystem and say, where are their holes and how can I fill them, right? If we have 20 rappers, 20 producers, one manager, all right, you can step back and say, okay, there's 20 other... These, Half of this talent needs another representation out here. So instead of forcing myself into the art side of it, I'm going to go on the business side and, and help some of the artists that I love. Mm, that's fascinating. What do you think about the Chicago music scene that might need more of something else, so to speak? Like like Chris Classic was, was in this room not too long ago, not for my show, but for Rivet, Shout Out Rivet. He, uh, and he talked about, does, this, does Chicago really need another studio? And... You mean you can never get enough of the studios? Shout out, <laughs> shout out to Chris. And if you need a studio, go to Classic Studios. Um, well, I think we just need more diversity across the board. Like we we need more PR. We need more attorneys. There's not a lot of me out here, so need more PR. Me, no, more lawyers. More people that can help create content for some of these artists. And I'm not talking about the audio content. The video video content you know with tiktok instagram being so captivating now artists need that so it's just more or less the overall services and if you look at the the landscape anything that people are running to new york and la to get done we need to be able to provide Mm. here in chicago that's it that's a very interesting way to put it because a lot of the time talking about the new york la dichotomy or however you want to describe it i never thought of it like that like oh Whatever people go for there, just provide it here. here. Yeah, 
It's so simple. I mean, solution based, man. <laughs> Everything is like looking at the what they say: find a sickness, create a cure. You know, and you take that mindset into the cultural ecosystem. You can figure out where jobs can be created. Hmm. Hmm. Interesting, because it's like the obvious. I, I don't know. There's something in particular that, that was so interesting about the the way you said it. That just like clicked. But anyway, um, what do you as as someone who's versed in IP, uh, what do you see artists generally struggle to understand or maybe just don't know like if they educated themselves a little bit on ip related stuff that would help them out i think overarching and when we're talking ip is understanding your value so one understanding your value and your person or your brand and then understanding the value of copyright how long does this last how much revenue can be generated from it? Why are people interested in purchasing said IP from me? Once they have an understanding of that, they'll do much better in negotiation because they'll go into the table saying, okay, this $10,000 advance for three albums doesn't make sense because I can make X off of my money by myself. Understanding their value is where they get tricky, mm -hmm. you know? What do you, speaking of... Uh understanding their value and you say on your website receiving the compensation they deserve for their work like what what's up with the music industry and the nature of being an artist that makes it so people don't often understand their value or receive the compensation they deserve really getting into the music industry we're looking at an industry that was created under uh mob organization in a sense really you know there, there, there are i mean you do have businessmen in that but there are a lot of ties to uh, gangs and mobs and within that and then there's also the notion of an un understanding that the music industry is very predatory mm. right we have a lot of higher ups that see talent and are able to snatch said talent because of the desperation of the artist right, right? so when you run it when you have that framework people are going to get taken advantage of all the time right and that goes back to the value conversation of like uh, artists understanding where their worth is. It's coming from the ones that are creating the contracts, the ones that are creating the deals, know the situation that a lot of artists are in, so they're taking advantage of that. You know? What? Why do you? I mean, you just said it a little bit, but why is it that the music industry is predatory? And like, what might people be able to move or do or push towards to make it not so? I guess that fame element. Because if we're doing business, we're doing a business-to-business -business transaction, and it's, in a sense, behind closed doors, you're selling me a number of chairs, or whatever the case may be. We can just do business, and that'll be that. In the music industry or entertainment industry, we're adding the fame element into it, right? So I can get you to sign this deal knowing that the terms are bad, but if I can dangle that carrot of clout or fame in front of you, you're more than likely to come deal with my organization right you can't use fame and clout in other service industries right nobody's gonna you can't use clout to get me to come do legal work no you have to compensate <laughs> me for said legal work right you know that whole uh exposure tagline you can use that in music hey this will be great exposure for you just come on over and do three records for my album and let me keep all the copyright behind them but it's going to put you in a better spot tomorrow never mind the fact it's going to make that uh, that producer or that label super rich they'll hit you with the oh the exposure you'll be able to write your own ticket after that like so that mm -hmm. element of being able to dangle that in front of people i think is what allows for some of those bad negotiations to happen and it's wild because you know and i know that a lot of the time exposure does not equate to money it does not translate all the time not at all like now if we're talking hey come do this ad we're going to be on Times square your face with your website driving traffic to your place right right that's right. okay but just to use someone's image and things of that nature yeah it's not really translatable especially yeah, yeah. Financially, in the most part, you know? That's interesting, because, like, if artists got a little bit more uh, educated on that business side of things, like, oh, if they have a, my face on Times Square, but then I'm selling something on my website and they have the website there, versus, like, just your face being there alone, just yeah. to show the world that you exist. 
That's why you need that those business minds around you that actually care. Because oftentimes that's what's happening in my negotiations when I'm talking with artists. We're going through the big picture of whatever's happening, whatever the program is, a branding opportunity is. We're saying, okay, how can we intersect something that you need to sell in this campaign? How can we make sure that we're driving traffic to your site based upon this campaign? Just mm-hmm. thinking things through because negotiation is me offering you something and then you having to come back with something. If you're not aware of the value that you have in yourself, you're not coming back with the appropriate responses, right? So it's more or less on us as people that call ourselves execs or people behind the scenes to start educating artists a little bit more. How does someone determine what their what their worth is? Because uh, you like on the one end, you have someone who's incredibly talented, gifted, or has an asset that's really valuable, but they just don't see it. And then on the other hand, you have someone who's like, I'm the greatest. And it's yeah. like, slow down, buddy. You're not the greatest. Well, I mean, I, I think it is to actually understand that as artists, they, we have to be more of open to having conversations about what we're truly getting comp- what we're truly getting what our compensation package really looks like how much money we're truly generating so if we're having those discussions amongst each other one promoters and outside forces aren't going to give us the low ball number now we have an understanding of what everybody's getting and now i can fairly value myself if me and you both have about the same amount of streams same amount of ig followers and a brand comes in and gives you 10k for a couple posts now i can say to myself i'm not taking anything less than maybe mm. eight or nine k because i know what the, what the bar is set you know uh this organization that i started the new vanguard came out was created out of that necessity where we needed to create a situation where artists were understanding of what the market share what the market looked like how much was, m- money was being generated from ads what you should be typically getting for these types of services right before those conversations weren't happening so again back to the predatory aspect of it major companies could come in and just nickel and dime you away as opposed to the community getting together talking saying this is what i make this is what you make doesn't have to be about pocket watching or trying to one-up somebody but just actually sharing information about what they're getting out here Mm. is going to be important so you think ultimately it would be a lot more beneficial for people in general in the music industry if artists were more transparent about what they get compensated for yeah definitely and it doesn't have to be a, oh, I'm going to go on IG Live and show you my, <laughs> my, my tax account. return on my bank account. <laughs> but in those com- when we're having these conversations, and then it's kind of gets people get cloudy a little bit, and they're like, oh, I signed my deal for $2 million, but they don't break down. Okay, 1.5 of that was the marketing budget. I only walked away with 500 <laughs> Half of that 500 has to go towards recording, and then now I'm sitting here with 250. The 250 gets taxed at a certain amount, so I'm actually walking away with. Let's say they end up with 120 at the end of the day after paying legal fees, managers, everybody else. Mm. Yeah. So yeah, now yeah. that can be an honest conversation. Hey, if you sign for that two million, that three million deal, you're probably going to walk away with a hundred. Take right, that hundred, right, right. put it here, do something as opposed to the mindset of, oh, homie over there went for three million. He's right, up, right. up now, right? Let's have honest conversations. And then also, like, the clout aspect even comes into that. Like, I remember s- seeing this clip from, it must have been in the 90s or something, of Dame Dash talking about how, like, you, it, just a hypothetically, you walk away from uh, a deal that's a million and then taxes and then uh, everybody thinks you got more than, than you actually have. So you, you put all, you put everybody back on at home and then, uh, you spend a lot of money on clothes and you spend a lot of money on jewelry cause you got to look the part and then so on. And so suddenly you're like, yeah. And then that's in advance. So you're not seeing any more money from the label until they've recouped every dollar that they've given you. So yeah, now you're sitting in a situation where you're like, okay, what's next? And then desperation sets in and then we get a little bit more predatory behavior cause you're going back to the label asking for and uh, another advance or something like that now you're deeper in debt over there right that's wild right it's kind of like almost like a bank not I mean, directly it, comparable it's, com- it's kind of comparable um the only difference is the bank when you go in there to mortgage your house at the end of the day you get to keep your house once you once you reach the requirements in music if you're not getting your masters back the label's on in that so yeah Man. bank's a little bit cooler in the most part <laughs> It wasn't a. <laughs> it wasn't a. On, on a, on a. Did you? I saw this. I forget who it was. But there was this clip on Instagram where the guy was like, 
uh, oh, I didn't go to I didn't go to college, but they they offered me a scholarship. They offered me a scholarship for that seven was million. Yeah, that was Yeah, <laughs> that was the funniest one of the funniest cuts. And anytime I I watch certain podcast interviews, I'm like. I, that's, I couldn't be the interviewer because I'm calling Cap and I'm like, hey, please stop lying on my platform. Right? Well, he, he, first he said, said five, then he said 10, then he's like 15. I'm like, 15 for, a, for a band scholarship? Bro, no way. That's not even possible. The band's budget is probably five million for the entire year. Like, no way they gave you that. They even offered you that. Well, I mean, what would you have done in that situation? Are you going to say, all right, man, I know you're lying? I, I, don't, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. But hey, man, I'm going to need you to stop lying on my platform, please. Thank you. <laughs> I, I, like to see, I like to see where somebody's train of thought Just let go. them keep, oh, so just like, throw it out there. Let them keep running with it. All right. Like, there are lots of people that I don't necessarily think are, quote, unquote, good people, which is also, like, I don't feel comfortable describing people as good or bad people a lot of the time. But also, like, uh... Like like Emma and I were talking yesterday. Like I would interview Kim Jong Un. Like somebody somebody might hear me say that and be like, "Slow that's, down, bro." That's kind of wild. <laughs> I hear you. Yeah. But not to give him a platform per se, but just because I want to see what's in his brain. Right. Like, <laughs> the only when it comes to those type of guys, if you're well versed enough to challenge them and go back and forth then you can have those type of conversations. I hate it when they bring somebody in and they're not versed on it, so they're just up there spewing their rhetoric for an hour mm. and a half, and there's nobody to challenge them because they haven't done enough research on the opposing side. So it's mm. like, if you're going to do that, have your facts together yeah. and be ready to actually fight yeah, with the person, yeah. you know? That's interesting, yeah. Especially if it's a powerful person, you don't want to bring them on just to have them go on and on about right. are, the propaganda they're already trying to. Then they're going to go there and just sell their propaganda yeah. on your platform. You're going to look crazy. <laughs> so, yeah, man. Huh, that's and make sure you space my interview and the Kim Jong <laughs> interview apart. Like, have me up here and the Kim Jong a little further down, please. Yeah, just in case the algorithm. I don't want to get like see videos <laughs> right, right, right next, right next to each other. Nah, and he's facing <laughs> part one, part two, and I'm like, wait, how did I get tied into this? Like, <laughs> that's so funny, bro. That's hilarious. Uh, you uh, you do a lot of intense workouts. I try to, yeah. I work. How does it feel to be a swole lawyer? Uh, it feels good when I'm sending <laughs> emails back, knowing in the back of my mind that, that you could whoop this I could definitely <laughs> deadlift everybody in that office. So it gives me great confidence to know that. And it's, and it's you know, it's exhilarating, you know, when I'm able to do curls and I'm sitting there like, if I see this lawyer face to face, <laughs> it's over it's with. It's over with. Right? It just feels good. But no, shout out to shout out to the Dog Pound, shout out to Kofi Hughes. Those are my guys. And it's the workout actually we do it where it's six AM and it just keeps my mind wired for the rest of the day. It gives me great energy. And I've anytime you hear from like the greats or these moguls, they're all saying, I'm up by five thirty, I'm up by five, getting my workout in and then starting my day. So you follow that rhetoric. Now, if you're working out by six, starting your day by seven, you're ahead of a lot of people, mm -hmm. you know. And then at the end of the day, you're feeling pretty satisfied or fulfilled. A lot of times people stay up super late at night because they feel like they've haven't satisfied their day. So now they're yeah. trying to make up for it. That's that. I know? do that a lot. Recently. Get up early, knock it all out. <laughs> and then at night you can you can rest easy because you got to get uh. your sleep. Are you sleeping? Yeah, well, yeah. Sleep, yeah. man. Get your sleep. Like, that whole sleep is causing the death thing is is a myth. Mm. Get some rest, please. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, you're young now, so you can, like, crank out the hours. But as you get older, make sure you're getting that rest, bro. Rest is very, rest is very, very uh, important. I, I've heard it from people, like, a lot of the time you can reduce your sleep quota, but only if you're sleeping properly. As in, like, people, a lot of the time, anyway... Yeah, you got to get REM sleep and all that. You can't just take a nap. You actually get, get into deep sleep to recover. Mm. Like, you put your phone on the charger, right? Right? You charge your phone, right? Why would you, you charge your brain? Yeah, man. You need that thing. I, I, I definitely need mine, so I have to <laughs> get rest, right? <laughs> what, um, does it feel, does it, how does it feel to have, like, a workout crew? Does it kind of it, it, it goes back to my college days. feels like 
that whole aspect it really helps because a lot of things that we do in the workouts i wouldn't do by myself mm. so now i'm getting pushed and i'm reaching um going into that uncomfortable space is when you really find out about yourself and i think that's like a microcosm to the world and how you're supposed to perform yeah. sometimes you got to get into that uncomfortable space to find out something new about yourself that now untaps something that brings like more blessings to your life. So I think approaching the weights like that has now altered my thinking in the world. That's uh, fascinating. You know. That's like, it reminds me of a quote that uh, everything is preparation for the big show. Makes sense. Like if you're approaching your workouts, like I'm going to have these people around me who are going to push me to go that extra mile that otherwise I wouldn't like how is that going to affect my approach to doing pushing the extra mile at my work or who something? are the people I'm going to bring around my business that are going to push me am I going to bring around people that are going to tell me oh yeah you're cool you did great last quarter or you're going to have people around you to say alright last quarter was cool but let's step it up a little bit more right mm. let's, let's put some more reps in let's get some more hours in so it's always important Hmm, interesting. Uh, I want to go back to like the the empowering artists thing. Like, what what do you think? Uh, it's just a shame to me how there's so much like all all the like uh, either either desperation or extremely like strong craving for fame will push people to do all type of strange behavior. And uh, yeah, I wish I had the signs behind that. <laughs> But I don't know why. It, but it, it's what it is, man. People, and it's not just not entertainers anymore. It's like society is craving that attention. Yeah, yeah. You know, like that's why you see a lot of these TikTok yeah. viral moments, right? Moments later. Shoot, sure, we're back. Maybe we could talk. Maybe we could talk about Chicago. So, like, what what do you think? Um, what do you think Chicago needs, or maybe not needs, but. What would help if people were more cognizant about or like if they pushed towards a little bit more in their day to day behavior that would make this like a more unified city in terms of its music, culture, creative? I think we're getting there. You know, I mean, not to say that you you were prefacing it as as it was a bad thing, but I think the notion has been. Chicago doesn't work together. There's a lot of haters or it's very selective, gatekeeping, all that. That was the notion in the past, but I feel like, and I've seen a lot more community, Mm -hmm. and that's what is important. Community and collaboration is what's really going to push us forward. We are the most talented artists in the world. You think so? Like, all right, let's run through. The list? I mean, we have (laughs) Ye, right? We have have the Quincy's, right? Michael was right up the street, and Gary, right? Like, let's, Virgil. Like, come on, man. Hmm, We have the most talent overall as far as, like, natural talent. We can't talk about the R&B guy, but his music was amazing as well. Who's the R&B guy? Yeah, we can't talk about him. Everybody in the comments (laughs) will know who we're talking about when you say R&B. I don't know. But I guess the the, the (laughs) people in the comments will know who we're talking about. (laughs) Right, so the talent is there. It's a lot of unnurtured talent. So I don't think on the creative side there's anything else that needs to be done. It's more or less the, the onus is on us as business people to make sure that we're nurturing this talent and getting them the attention and the looks that they desire. Oh, I know who you're talking about. I oh, got it. Yeah, see? <laughs> <laughs> All right, now, I would like to see... <laughs> It took me a minute. It took me a minute. I was thinking, hmm, what is this guy talking about? Good. Right. So the only thing I would like to see is when we come to the representation of Chicago in our music scene, especially within rap, that the picture of, of the diversity is shown as opposed to the main focus being with drill music, which is, there's nothing mm. wrong with that, but you need that – the that yin and yang flow of things if you're going to really represent Chicago because now everybody's mindset is that this is just the one this is Chicago music Mm -hmm. even though this is an element and this is a part of Chicago and that story needs to be represented there are other stories in Chicago that, Mm -hmm. that need that focus right so I think it's on us as far as that community and collaboration to start uplifting and pushing some of this talent that we see that that's outside of that spectrum 
I met this one girl from the UK who told me drill music came from the UK. Yeah, I just showed her the Google they search have no I- Yeah, they have no idea. <laughs> now, I will say the New York drill sound derives from UK drums. Oh, interesting. So, yeah, if you listen to earlier UK drill, the sound that New York drill is now comes from that. Hmm. But the term drill... And the whole overarching idea behind it is very much a Chicago thing. Right. What about, um, yeah, it's, it's interesting that you say uh, there are these, <clears throat> that the reality of the city is that there is stuff here and there that isn't uh, going well in the scene or how, however. But when people describe these narratives to me of like, Oh, Chicago, uh, people in Chicago are hate it, haters, people in Chicago are gatekeeping, people in Chicago don't want to work with each other, uh, nobody wants each other to win. Doo, 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 no, that's just, I'm tell you this, nobody wants to work with you. <laughs> that's all it is, they don't want to work with you. Every, everybody working, I work with people, Matt working with people, we all working with people. People that like us, they work with us. Don't nobody want to work with you and your bad attitude and all your ego. They're not trying to get in the studio with you because they don't like you they're not gatekeeping anything nobody can gatekeep around here there's no gates you can get through whatever you want i'm sorry mm. but i just had to let the people know no like, that's that's and that's really dope and fascinating because i i sometimes wonder i do feel weird energy here and there because you know chicago has it has its flaws but i wonder how much of this these narratives are actually just people saying that it's true versus it actually being true and it's just something that people talk about if you keep repeating it like it'll start you can start start to to see see it it. right but it doesn't mean it's truly there it's It's just your perception of it right because i'm like how many people have ever gatekept me i've never been gatekept yeah and then it's like (laughs) if me and you are homies and we've developed a we have a great report and we built this amazing business we're not just gonna let anybody come in to our business, right? There's gonna be some type of vetting before we add more people to my business. Mm -hmm. So if I got a crew that I rock with, me and my crew, we over here tight, we making our music together, you're gonna have to show me something to start rocking with me. That's not considered gatekeeping, that's protecting my brand and Mm -hmm. what I've built, right? So there's a difference in that as well. Like Nobody's just shunning you sometimes, first of all. Like, how is your approach Mm -hmm. in networking? Are you asking people, are you trying to link build? The very first five seconds you meet somebody, or you just try, are you actually genuinely trying to figure out who they are as a person? Like, you gotta understand the difference. Yeah, yeah, that's true. And I think I've, I've gotten better with it over time as I've ma- matured more. But people are so quick to be like, "Oh, you don't fuck with me." Oh, oh, uh, you don't want to work with me? All right, fuck you. It's Man, like, like, all right, bro. <laughs> Like, I'm not going to like all the people I work with, and I'm not going to work with all the people that I like, right? We could have a rapport on just talking about the White Sox or whatever and never have to do business together. But if I came into the approach of what can you do for me? Oh, you can't? I don't need to rock with you. That's not building a network, and that's Mm -hmm. not actually doing anything positive, right? Who knows? We could have our conversation about the White Sox, and we just keep chopping it up. And you got a homie that comes in town. That's the perfect connection for me, my business, and his, Mm -hmm. right? But I would have blown that shot if all I was focusing on, what can you provide me right now? Right, right, right. right. That's very true. And also, like, what do did you think made – why do you think I hate you? Because I left your Instagram DM on red? Like, like, no, I don't hate you. I was just busy. Like, And I saw it. Yeah, I forgot to respond because you asked me a million questions. <laughs> and I'm not answering those because I charge by the hour. And this is going to take me two hours to do. So, no, I'm not responding to any of this. But, no, shout out to you if you responded. Send me a DM and I didn't respond. There's no hate. I'm just potting right now. I'm not that mean of a person. <laughs> Huh. Um, what what do you think the Chicago music scene has going for it right now that should be like amplified, invested in, or just like uh, you know, given more? Would energy? you say music scene, or I just like the yeah, cre- creative scene creative in general? Scene, just like, the creative scene in general. It was. It's going crazy. Like there is, again, right now. I don't know. Maybe because I'm just so focused on our ecosystem, 
I don't know why else is doing it better than us when it comes to our artists. Not just mm. in the music scene. I'm talking about the Brandon Bros, the Alex Carters, you know what I'm saying? Like the Julian Log the Logics, you know what I'm saying? Like these artists are really out there doing some groundbreaking stuff right now. And it's like, okay, we have to nurture this. And from that, we get good music sometimes as well. That's true. You know, like when Renaissance occur, it's not just one, one medium. It's all different types of mediums. So as long as... The Mia Lee's out there still doing their thing. Chicago will be fine, right? That's dope. That's dope how um, when you see somebody do a great, have a great ability to express themselves through what they do, that could bleed into all type of other inspiration. Like how you probably draw inspiration from lots of things that don't necessarily have anything to do with law or creative, but they add to, like when you work out. True. Like if you think of one of uh, another great artist that we have in the city, Nico Washington. Mm -hmm. He's very tied into the music scene. Shout out to Nico. Yeah, shout out to Nico. He's never written a rap. He's never produced a beat. But his art inspires so many other people around him mm -hmm. that we get records from Chance. We get records from Joey. We get right. we get records from Kane. We get records from Vic. Based upon not based upon directly his influence of his of his art, but being around him and understanding how he creates. Now they can take some of those concepts right. into their music. So I think having so many great artists here in the city is just going to elevate the musicians that we have. I talked to him in Soho about a few days or a week ago, and he was like talking about getting more into architecture or in interior design. And he would go crazy with that. I would, wrong, yeah. He would super, yeah, he would snap that. He's also a member of, of the Dog Pound as well. 6 a.m. crew, he's the, there. The, the workout yeah, crew? Man. What's it called? The Dog Pound? Yeah, we gotta, <laughs> yeah. You, you can't laugh after you say okay, that. Okay, okay. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Serious business over here. We're talking about the dog pound, right? Yeah, I'm sure if I, if, I'm sure if I, if I laughed at, at at the the name the dog pound around the dog pound, they would all look at me a little weird. They'd be like, "All right, let's see if you can knock out these box jumps." You got jokes. What's good? Sled runs. What um? What else? Let's see what other questions I have here. Uh, I just finished watching Scandal. The suits as well. Uh, I was just filling in for you, <laughs> going through some TV shows or whatever. Do you do you consume? How do you do you consume entertainment? Like, are you a TV show guy? Do you I'm do a TikTok stuff? guy. You give me a spy espionage series, I'm all in. Like Narcos? Like, no, I'm talking no. like. Oh, there's a mole in the CIA <laughs> trying to assassinate the uh -huh. vice president. Oh, I'm in. Like, oh. <laughs> so, what was the think, last one? Do you think stuff like that really happens? Yeah. Moles in the CIA trying I to mean, assassinate the... The concepts come from somewhere. That's true. Like, it might not be that elaborate, but I'm pretty sure the idea of derives from some form of truth, you know? That freaks me out. Like, that, that makes me... There are certain things that make me afraid of success not certain things actually one thing in particular which is just that like if you get to a certain level then people see you as a target yeah i mean they see you as a target if what you're trying to bring to the world goes against the agenda hmm. in a sense and we don't have to get to that rabbit hole of what that means <laughs> but that's just really it is if you stay the course and you just entertain the people you'll be fine hmm. you don't think if even if you're like for example like a Drake, he's just so he's just so huge that every that uh, trying to make fun of him or something like gives a lot of people uh, motivation to do. Yeah, but he's not he's not considered a threat by anybody because he's not really speaking on anything. So he's not likely to get assassinated. He's just likely to be hated on. Uh. Yeah, I don't want even. I don't want to put that out there. Yeah, my bad. Right. Let me take that. Let me take that back. That's a little bit weird and dark, but I, I'm, but no, I, I'm I, trying to make I, a different I, point. No, I see what you're saying. I, like until he gets to the point of like take a person like Ye, for example. Why? I'm sorry, Drake. I take that back. Yeah, because he might have a show and then he'd be like, "Man, what the man, fuck? Why did you say? What you mean? I'm not getting Would you disgusting. look at a guy like Ye when he stuck with the establishment? He was fine as soon as he started speaking out on things whatever his opinion was it triggered a certain group of people and he was now eliminated from the the scene right so if you just play the course i think you'll be okay 
this is a big tension that also we don't don't want to go down this rabbit hole but kanye deals with like a with a genuine uh, manic depressive illness is a genuine mental illness it's it's something that i've experienced firsthand and to to see him go through that and know what's going on in his head and to know that probably 90 percent of what he said felt like it was gospel messiah going on in his head but out in the aftermath probably didn't resonate much with him right. that much and but he the world's he doesn't have the time to explain that to people and the people don't will not feel like they have the time to hear that because he said what he said already and anyway but that's a whole other and i'm just glad you have the empathy for that and you can actually see a bigger picture and not just take the words for the words but understand the scope uh, not not a lot, a lot of people have that in, in them you know they just I downloaded all the infowars videos on my computers because they're like case studies <laughs> i could show people these videos i'm like this is what's going on in his head right now because i went through this shit and like this is what it means to have bipolar. Like, just watch this InfoWars video. Right. Shout out Ye, though. Yeah. Shout out Ye. Uh, the, hope um, he gets better. Yeah, yeah. We need more slaps. <laughs> what um? What are you looking forward to in your personal life right now? W whether it's your work or your family. Oh, we, we you dropped a great gem before we started recording because I was trying to get my SD cards going on how you call your wife your homie and i'm like that's yeah. what's up now, that's my homie that's my dog she doesn't <laughs> she really hates when i call her my homie but i don't care and i'm saying it publicly now that's yeah that's my homie so we really enjoy time together you know a lot oftentimes people are in relationships they may love the person they with but they don't like them all the way you know and i really enjoy being with my wife so personally <laughs> that is just, not fucked up though it kind of is <laughs> and it was funny a lot of people realize that during the pandemic because that before the pandemic, you work your job, I work my job. We're only spending four or five hours a day around each other. They were stuck in the house with each other for months on end. They were like, wait, I really don't like you, <laughs> which is kind of sad. But It's kind of sad. But it's wild to me that you would decide to hang out with someone indefinitely for the rest of your life and and be only 90 percent sure that you really like spending time well yeah we had real situations real conversations beyond just lusting for each other that right I, you, you gotta have those you gotta you know what are your ideas on family what are your ideas on religion what are your ideas on uh home ownership all those type of conversations you gotta have and sometimes people are just too lustful and they just like oh i'm sexually infatuated with this person this is who i want to be with that's that I mean, not to say it goes away, but at, at a certain point in a relationship, now it's time to actually talk about real things, you know. Yeah, when when the day comes that you're not hijacked by your hormones anymore, then your brain is also going to eject its... It's going to uh, be like, what's really going on here, right? <laughs> like, but yeah, yeah we got to shout out to wife too, because shopalexcarter.com is the brand. Shopalexcarter.com. Uh, she's amazing, super talented. Running two brands, Black Women Are Essential, and her own brand, Alex Carter. So I'm super proud of her, and like whatever way I can be of assistance. I mean, I give so much time to other artists. I'm always trying to make sure that I give time to her, not only as a husband, at, but also as a lawyer, and making sure everything that she has going on is moving steadily as well. Wow, that's super dope. What do you think? Uh, do you have any more? Any? I feel like you have more gems here. Like, what do you think makes a good relationship between two people? like work like what do you do to maintain that enthusiasm is it all like you have bad days and yeah man you have really bad days you have really good days you have okay days and everybody's gonna say it's communication it's not just communication it's the way in which you communicate and actually saying what you feel as opposed to beating around the bush but actually getting to the heart of the mm -hmm. conversation we're not having a conversation about me not doing the dishes that's not the issue right, it's right, right. about the amount of time i'm spending or focused on at the house so how can we have a real conversation to get to the root of what you might be upset about or what might have upset, upset me so then we can grow from that because it's not always going to be cool and then that's when you really learn like what type of partner you have is okay we've had this spat how do we move forward from here right hmm. I think a lot of the time, too, when people are talking about the dishes, even though they're really worried about, about something else, sometimes people may not even know that, like, they may actually think it's the dishes. Yeah. So that we take our time in our communication, too. So if it's something that's like 
can be heated or considered heated, we'll take a step back and review, review it later on after emotions have subsided a little bit. Now we can actually focus in on what's going on. Because you run into situations, you have that emotionally charged conversation, you say a couple of things that you can't take back. Mm. Now when you're waking up in the morning, y'all like, looking damn. at each other a little different, like, damn, oh, man. I shouldn't have said that. To, yeah, next time, take a second and think about it, you know. Hmm. What, um, how do you think law can be rebranded as cooler? Because I feel like if more young people out here didn't think lawyers were lame and boring, that they might enjoy it. I don't care. We, ain't, bro, gotta, <laughs> we are lame. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> I just happen to go. I have a little bit. I got some cool homies that show me some things. Like, but most of us are lame. Nah, nah, bro. We don't need to be cool. We need to get a job done. <laughs> I think that's the problem. People are like, oh, I want to. I want to do the cool thing. I want to. And now, like, everybody goes and chases the cool job as opposed to like, you know, the me being a lawyer. That's my skill set. That's it. I'm really good at being a lawyer. But Eddie. As a person, like my morals and my values, that's all I really care about. Like, mm -hmm. I'm going to get the job done because of how my father raised me and what my mother taught me when I was younger, right? So we're not going to be able to find – I mean, if you're a cool person, you're just going to be cool, and then you could be a chef. Like you. you could be – yeah, right? Because you – I like how you <laughs> brought that at the beginning, and now it's full circle – cool guy see <laughs> that's why you going places bro <laughs> but no like you just honestly you gotta be you can't just say oh i'm about to make the law practice cool again you just gotta be a mm. cool person and go with it but maybe uh yeah, you have a cap make lawyering cool again great make lawyering great no i'm, I'm playing I'm with it. We can make some bread off that. Like, I don't care. Like, nobody's going to be mad at me. This is a really fascinating point you're bringing up, though, of, like, maybe people put too much emphasis on this competitive social thing of, like, I have the cooler thing going on than you do, and now you feel bad because what you're doing isn't as cool as what somebody you're looking at. You're looking on the gram, going through their story, and, you know, like, they might be running the same content over and over again. They're like, bro, his job is so lit. He's always on a boat. He's always doing this, always doing that. But he's an intern, not knocking an intern on but he's not even, he doesn't even work there. He's just showing you these images and you, oh, I'm infatuated. I got to work. I got to have his job. No, go over there and get your salary, get your money up. Don't worry about what you see in these. Because uh, people can make, the, yeah. we talk, the perception conversation, like they can make anything appear to be cooler than what it really is, right? So yeah. what is even a cool profession? Right? That's a good question. What is a cool profession? Like back in 2020, tech wasn't considered like the it job, right? I mean, you had the start of Silicon Valley, the tech guys out there, but nobody looked at that crew and said, yo, those dudes are cool. Now, if you introduce someone, you're like, I work in tech, they're like, oh, word, okay. Right? So it wasn't the nature of people just saying, oh, we about to make this cool. It's just, no, we have such an impact on society. Y'all have to look at us a certain way now. Mm, interesting. That's an interesting way to put it. So maybe the goal is that people should just try to have, like, hopefully a positive one of impact and that other stuff will come from that. Yeah, I mean, I, I try and live with positive impact and try and make sure – that just the conversations I have with people when they walk away, they're like, "Well, right, that's a pretty cool dude right there. Or, yeah, that's a, yeah. a genuine guy right there. Like, just off of our first conversation at Wonder Museum, right? Mm -hmm. well, we really didn't talk business, anything like that. We just chopped it up about life. And it seemed like, all right, I was rocking with his vibe. Man, that's a pretty cool dude. So we stayed in contact, <laughs> right? Now I'm up here doing the podcast, yeah, right? Yeah, now exactly. we're talking about business stuff. But it started from just actual human interaction and yeah, not yeah, yeah. oh i'm a lawyer oh let really? me let me read some contracts <laughs> to you right like no let so, me see some contracts <laughs> right you got a contract you show me your contract skills you, you got a contract freestyle you can steal <laughs> for me right quick like no nah. contract freestyle is crazy <laughs> i'm sure have people ever asked you like yo like yo eddie um 
Like, have you? Do you ever get like unsolicited requests to look at like, yo, Eddie, just just look at this contract really quick. Can you just look at this contract? Yeah, Can you just uh, take thirty minutes out. I of used your day? to. I used to tweet a lot. There's no such thing as a quick question. Cause every that's what people used to hey hey when you got a minute hit me up and you know most of the time homies I hit them up like yeah what's going on so yeah check it man I got this offer on this table from this publishing company it's like a ten year deal yada yada can you look over it for yeah, me the minutes up bro well, hey bro that's <laughs> not a quick question now I will somebody real quick like hey man uh, I want to use this YouTube video segment from this YouTube video in this video over here can I get away with that. That's a, all right, cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll go through with that. But I get that often, and I'd rather have those conversations because oftentimes it's more beneficial for me and that person financially because now what's happened, I've tapped something else in their mind that opened up a bigger idea. So now mm. they're like, okay, there's a bigger bag that we're going to attack, and Eddie was the one to help me think about mm. this. I'm going to bring him in on the contract. All right, so mm-hmm. it has to be a, you got to give away some of this information to retain clients and, and to get people to know that you really have this knowledge, right? Yeah, that's interesting. You know, whatever whatever kind of business relationship it is, whether it's what you described right now or um, working with some kind of client or even like selling drugs, like you give a little bit away for free and then true people right. realize the value of what you specifically provided and then they go back like, to Eddie I, for actually, the goods. this is smoking. <laughs> All right, yeah. What's buddy number again? <laughs> so yeah, protecting the collect. <laughs> protect and collect. Our, our law game is smoking. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a and that's a wrap. <laughs> We rapping for real? Yeah, no, I think that, okay. Anything you want to plug, anything you want to shout out, uh, any final words of wisdom, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, Artists, get a better understanding of your value. Protect yourself in that way. Understand how much you're worth. Understand what your name is worth. Understand what your catalog is worth. Speak to appropriate people when it comes time to make decisions. Talk to people that have knowledge about the decisions that you're trying to make. And... Hit me up if you ever need me. I'm the lawyer here in Chicago. I'm Chicago's lawyer. Protect and collect. SandersESQ.com. I don't need to run through all that. I guess we can just like, at this point, have a little, little, we're going to point the little button, subscribe here type story. But no, shout out to, shout out to Chelsea. Shout out to my wife and everybody over at the new Vanguard. Everybody at the new Vanguard. Eddie. Finesse Squire, Swole Squire. Swole Squire, that's, yeah, Swole Squire 2.0. I like that one. Let's go. Woo! Thanks, Ed. Peace.